Great. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Tania Caron. I'm a dance performance psychotherapist and I'm a lecturer at uh, University of South Wales who is hosting this event uh, together with Martha Lesher Trust. And um, essentially uh, they applied for funding for the Cultural Recovery Fund to create an arts therapies outreach program, which is going to which is starting now um, in Mirtha with some residents. And then as part of that, we decided to also hold an online symposium uh, so that we could get an introduction to all the arts therapies, look at collaborations and get a gist of what's happening in, in the arts therapies world in Wales. Uh, with some case examples and examples of working with clients and today uh, the the afternoon well the day will start with with joshua davy stewart uh, who will introduce himself <laughs> very soon and music therapy and then we'll have drama therapy afterwards and then so you have the agenda the copy of the agenda i'll i'll post it in here while uh, joshua's starting so we'll have a chance to ask questions. You can ask the questions via the chat at any time, and I will um, uh, feed these back to, to, to the speaker throughout the afternoon. The afternoon, I keep saying afternoon, but it's the whole day. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our music therapy presenter, Joshua Davy Stewart, and spotlight for everyone. <laughs> Welcome. Hey, everyone. Uh, just checking if you guys can give me a, a thumbs up that um, I can be heard and everyone can see me. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we're all good. Brilliant. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'll get on, uh, share my screen, get my PowerPoint up. Okay. Um, Brilliant. Yeah. So thank you for the introduction, uh, Tanya. I'm really excited to be kind of kicking off this Arts Therapies in uh, Wales Symposium. Uh, as Tanya said, I'm Joshua Davies Stewart. Um, I am a Healthcare Impressions Council, HCPC registered music therapist. Um, I'm based in, in Cardiff, um, self-employed. Uh, I run Nodding Glass, which I'll go into in, in a little bit. Um, and I graduated from the, the master's course at USW in 2019 uh, and uh, I'm currently kind of working um, as a clinical supervisor internally and externally so I have um, been part of the lecturing team at USW for um, well for the last term which has been wonderful. Uh, so in this presentation um, I'm aware we've kind of got uh, quite drastic differences between um, understanding of, of what music therapy is first and foremost, what music therapy um, has been what music therapy can be, the potentials, um, the clients kind of, I'm aware that, that, that um, our understanding may be quite varied in this group. Um, so I'm going to do my best to cover as much as I can. Um, if you guys have any questions, um, pop them in the chat. If kind of Tanya, maybe if you could kind of monitor them and we'll have a bit of time for, for questions at, at the end. Um, and yeah, I guess so that, uh, as well as that, then we're going to go into a, um, a case study. I've got a few different clips of my work with a, with a client, which I have permission to share um, for educational purposes. Um, and I think I'll just just get going and keep an eye on there uh, on what questions you guys have. OK. Ooh. I do apologize. My, uh, let's try again. There we go. That's uh, more reassuring. OK, so. I'm sure we're all aware of uh, kind of the therapeutic qualities of um, of music in our day-to-day -day lives, whether it's emotional regulation. Um, perhaps some of us use it to reflect on our feelings. Um, I know I certainly can tell um, whether I'm having a good day or a bad day, depending on which songs I skip, um, kind of when I've got everything on shuffle. Uh, but in a more active sense, um, I guess music provides a, a universal platform from which we can communicate significant elements of ourselves, uh, whether that's uh, kind of emotional state, um, whether it's as part of our uh, identity. Um, perhaps if you're a musician, it's part of your performative skills. Um, but music allows us to um, ultimately connect and build relationships with those around us. Um, but as a therapy, um, music therapy is a clinical psychological intervention uh, that focuses on building a relationship. 
um, mainly between uh, therapist and client, although in group settings kind of, you know, there's all sorts of group dynamics that can go on there. Um, and uh, as many individuals kind of find it difficult to um, verbalize their experiences, either as a result of complex needs or due to the kind of severity, the emotional significance of their experiences or, or the subject that they're kind of referred for. Um, music therapy offers kind of a creative alternative to traditional talking therapies. Um, music therapy, first and foremost, is, is delivered by music therapists, kind of what it says on the tin. Um, but the, the important part in that is that it is a, a protected title. Um, music therapists must hold uh, registration with the Health and Care Professions Council. Um, and that's by completing an approved uh, accredited postgraduate training course. Um, I said, I did mine at USW. I know there's a few people hear from USW today that are interested in the course. Um, and this just assures that uh, all practitioners continue to meet the um, standards of proficiency that are set out. We adhere to uh, their standards of conduct, performance, and um, work within an ethical evidence-based framework. Oh, I can't get to a picture of this pub. <laughs> there we are. Uh, uh, okay, so who's it for? Who can it benefit? Um, First and foremost, I'm a strong believer that therapy can benefit anyone and everyone. Um, but music therapy in particular um, kind of is notably um, effective uh, clinical intervention for those unable to access or perhaps comprehend verbal language, um, such as ASD, dementia, um, brain injury, um, profound and multiple learning disabilities. Um, this is also becoming uh, increasingly prevalent given the, the state of of the world at the moment with uh, the kind of uh, the need to um, support refugees and asylum seekers becoming more and more prevalent. The ability to move uh, and away from language and allow people to access therapeutic support is invaluable. Um, additionally, and this is what an awful lot of my work personally focuses on, is those that would rather not use verbal language. Um, I'm sure we can all kind of, I'm sure that resonates with an, an awful lot of us, but there are, um, for, I, I work mainly with adolescents and for an awful lot of them with their kind of the traumas they've been through and the things that they perhaps um, need support with. Uh, they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to engage in what um, perhaps they see as, as therapy. They don't want to sit in front of someone and, and completely open up to a complete stranger about some of the um, difficult experiences that they may have had. And that goes for kind of other client groups, including mental health difficulties, um, and for, for these kind of individuals, all of them, that, that, you know, people who can't access verbal communication or those that perhaps don't want to, um, just the, the chance to build an appropriate therapeutic relationship um, and to explore a, a safe, contained um, environment for emotions and difficulties is really quite in, invaluable in development and growth. Uh, music therapy is currently kind of uh, being worked at with uh, across the entire lifespan. Um, I'm aware that there was, I think it was recently something sent out um, via the WATAF network for work with um, pregnant mothers. And, and uh, also I'm aware that there's an awful lot of work going into neonatal intensive care units at the moment. Uh, and additionally, um, very, very recently, I um, was speaking to a colleague um, at City Hospice in Cardiff um, about the potentials um, for the arts therapies as a whole, but in my case, music therapy with um, grief and bereavement. So really a, quite a, a massively wide spectrum of possibilities. So why music therapy over other ones, I guess? Um, what are the benefits? Um, and as you can imagine, the spectrum of uh, needs and the accessible nature of this kind of intervention can yield a multitude of, of different benefits and outcomes. For a lot of clients, the benefits uh, lies within the opportunity to access support and experience, uh, um, kind of access experiences that otherwise may not have been available. For nonverbal clients, communication via a mutually accessible uh, medium may allow for social development in line with key developmental milestones. For adolescents, I've just kind of gone into a little bit, um, they uh, specifically the one uh, adolescents that have experienced quite severe trauma, um, a therapeutic intervention free from the expectations and confines of, of language may allow for consistent and um, an unpressurized relational development or provide tools for day-to-day -day emotional regulation. In a special educational needs setting, 
Group music therapy may support in social exploration, but could also display a benefit in educational engagement and resilience towards feelings of discomfort away from the therapy space. So the sessions, what actually happens in a music therapy session, that's a um, topic for debate and a, a very, very loaded question for a lot of us. Um, lots can happen within a, a music therapy session, but ultimately um, music therapy sessions traditionally include live music playing and making, um, uh, active improvisation, which um, is aimed at encouraging free expression, communication, um, and exploration of self within a therapeutic relationship. Uh, sessions may include um, songwriting, often with the intentions of promoting reflection and understanding of current or past trauma. Um, and this isn't to say that we only use music, music in sessions, sorry. Um, and even creating playlists together all have um, a place within the therapy um, space if needed. Um, and a key bit of this is it's alongside music therapists who can support in the understanding of the value of music in our everyday um, well-being. Music therapy spaces take place in a variety of different spaces to best suit the needs of the client and the service. Um, kind of therapy spaces, hospital wards, classrooms, wherever it is required. Um, one that immediately springs to mind is uh, I had a, I was working with a, a young person who had selective mutism. We were working together for um, three months and uh, always kind of participated in in active music making as a as a um, form of communication that he did feel comfortable with. Um, but during his last session, um, as it was quite difficult for him to process the ending of of our work and also there were other endings in his life, um, he wanted to go and kick a football round. And you know it it was appropriate and required at the time and felt like quite a, a nice concluding ending so at that point the therapy space was outside just the two of us on a playground um this is my therapy room i'm uh so i run nodding glass i said i'll go into that a bit more in in a moment um this room is within ocean art center which if any of you get a chance to check out it is a really wonderful um resource of, of spaces and and community potential. We have all sorts. There's currently a, a, a theatre troupe devising um, a touring puppet show in another room. But this is um, this is my room within a, a wider art centre. I'm really quite lucky as a practitioner that I have a, a dedicated space for, um, for music therapy. Um, I'm well aware that that is perhaps not um, a commonality. But as you can see, there's an awful lot of um, acoustic instruments. I was actually going to give you a tour of my room at this point because I'm currently sat in it. Um, but as you'll go on to see, I'm starting a project this afternoon and it looks like a bomb's hit it because there's absolutely like nothing left on the walls. Um, but as you can see, there's an awful lot of acoustic instruments and that's quite common and quite traditional in, um, in music therapy settings. They're accessible. Uh, they are familiar with a lot of client groups. Um, but additionally, in, in terms of kind of um, perhaps why my room looks quite full <laughs> is... Uh, there's a few of the electric instruments, there's some amplifiers, you can see a, a pedal board on the wall, and that's because I have a, a lot of teenagers which um, kind of working with improvised acoustic guitar, or working with improvised piano playing can feel quite vulnerable and also doesn't necessarily match up to um, their own musical interests. Um, so quite often I'll have people come in and, and you know, we'll, we'll rock out on a guitar and whether that counts as kind of the improvisational exploration. Um, or perhaps they'll be keen to show me something they've learned as kind of a, a wall or a, a barrier towards opening up. But this kind of engagement facilitates the developing of a relationship and also um, kind of facilitates discussion at the same time, kind of, you know, why, why we're playing what we're playing, um, what, what are our relationships with music, how do we use music away from a session um, for the benefit. Um, and additionally, I'll just go into to this if it's relevant. Um, Around the room, there's a few upcycled pro projects. So we've um, we've had, uh, which a couple of clients have been involved in, and kind of um, when I've had donations in, we've kind of rebuilt a lot of stuff. That little drum kit you can see on the side, that blue one, um, is a MIDI controller that I'm currently using with a 14-year-old a who's been involved in county lines and uh, other quite aggressive criminal behaviour. Now, he's been referred to me and has absolutely no intention of, of sitting and, and, and playing a djembe with me. It just doesn't resonate with him in perhaps the same way it does with with other clients so for him um building this together um it actually allows us to 
uh, we're currently in the process of writing um, some drill music together, which is which is a new one for me. Um, but while we're doing this, we've got access to, to sounds and um, music making opportunities that do resonate with him and, and, and hold certain value in him and his life. Uh, and he's able, he's becoming able to, to reflect on kind of the lyrics he's using and what he needs to say, what his voice is um, in general, but within our relationship and what it's like for him to have a, a healthy, appropriate um, therapeutic relationship seems to be really um, kind of reaping some benefits considering the short time we've been together. So this is what I've got. There's an awful lot of equipment. As you can see, there's a speaker on the side, which is actually used an awful lot for, for active listening. Lots of um, adolescent clients would rather put on a playlist and, and talk than the live music maker. And as I said, it's quite vulnerable. Um, but there's really a spectrum of, of what we can have on display. So I said I would give you a, I was thinking about giving you a tour, but it really didn't play off. Um, this is currently my car. That's why I'm not uh, showing you around the room because there's nothing left in it as I'm shooting off to it for a, uh, a group project up in Merthyr Tidwell as part of this, this, um, this batch of funding, this project that we're currently part of now, uh, begins for me at 11 o'clock. So that's why you're not having a live tour. Um, so music therapist, what is a music therapist? I have seen someone in the chat has uh, shown an interest in perhaps looking into that as a career choice. Um, and music therapist is an allied healthcare professional. Um, often in perhaps more in, in salaried positions than, than my current experience as self-employed, but um, a really valued members of a multidisciplinary team. Uh, the ability to work alongside speech and language with a lot of clients is, is really quite beneficial. Uh, and the insight that we can provide as part of this, um, perhaps by having a kind of a creative platform to explore, um, in my experience, has always been very, very valued by physios, OTs, uh, speech and language therapists, kind of, you know, the whole batch of us, um, as well as other arts therapies. Uh, I believe that there's, you know, a couple of collaborative projects um, up and coming, which I'm really excited to look into, um, which you might hear about more about today from other practitioners. Uh, they must hold current HCPC registration, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Um, it is a protected title, um, and that is accredited uh, postgraduate qualification. Music therapists have to demonstrate quite a high level of musicianship, um, and this is one of the things that kind of the HCPC stress that is uh, continued throughout um, your career progression and, and your, um, your work within the field. Uh, personally, I'm a, I'm a percussionist by trade uh, and a bass player, but uh, kind of having an ability to work on, on a wide variety of, of instruments is um, kind of considered a, a necessity. Um, and you may come across music therapists in all kinds of settings. Um, I'm not sure what a lot of your backgrounds are professionally, um, but if you work in kind of any of these ones listed here, the, the hospitals, PRUs, um, care homes, therapy centers, um, or uh, perhaps in prisons, you may come across us in, in these kind of areas where we're quite, we're becoming more and more familiar faces, which is, is wonderful. Uh, so um, I'd love to talk um, kind of about music therapy in general. And in fact, uh, after this, after I'm finished talking, um, I'll pop a link in the chat to um, kind of previous editions of, of this symposium and kind of, kind of previous chapters with previous contributors, uh, because there's a couple of really, really interesting videos in uh, online about kind of different different settings, different things that are working. Um, uh, yeah, I'll pop, I'll pop a link into that so you guys can kind of look through it in your own time. Um, so I thought it's probably, you know, best to talk about, about me and my work because I'm a little bit more knowledgeable about that than perhaps some other things. Um, and a lot of the other projects that I was aware about and really wanted to promote are promoted, have been promoted previously, and, and there are videos that you guys can, can access. Um, so Nodding Glass, that's my company. Um, it means blue note in Welsh for, for those of you that are, are unfamiliar with the Welsh language. Um, it's, it's, the idea is based off the blue scale, which is a, a note that doesn't quite, quite fit within a key, but ultimately makes it the blue scale. It has real sub, uh, substance and, and um, even non-musical people would probably be able to twig that that, that note is quite interesting. Um, and it comes with quite you know obvious connotations of feeling blue and, and the blue genre in total um this is music this is arts therapies in in wales this is what we're promoting and i'm a big advocate for um for wales as a, as a whole and how um wonderful our little part of the world can be um we're a music therapy service that 
you know, mainly adolescent trauma, um, child sexual exploitation and county lines is the bulk of my work. Um, so getting on to the, the CSE, the county lines stuff, um, this is a real passion project for me. Um, I fell into this work. Uh, when I graduated, I actually went and worked internationally. I worked in Kathmandu for a while until the, the pandemic sent me home. Um, I guess that kind of builds on, on kind of, you know, how accessible music is as a language. I had to kind of fine tune it to, to um, make sure I could understand the, the notions of Eastern music as opposed to what perhaps my ears are familiar with. But, um, you know, the project was so successful um, in Nepal without me being able to necessarily, I was going to say be fluent in Nepali, but that would still be being <laughs> very, very, um, uh, I'd be lying, to be honest with you. I tried my best. I was not the best, but I was able to, to um, provide support for those that needed it in ASD bases and things. Um, and then after that, I um, got a group, uh, sorry, got a job working across the southwest of England in trauma-informed care homes, which were all CSE stuff. Um, absolutely adored the work. And when I set up on my own, um, which was something I always wanted to do, I really wanted to keep this alive. There is a video on the Adolescent Resource Centre that has been completed by... Paul Morgan, who was my predecessor as a music therapist. Um, so yeah, the Adolescent Resource Centre is Cardiff Council's edge of care provision for uh, children and young people who are perhaps just uh, gone into care, um, are in and out of care a lot, or um, perhaps there are concerns that things are escalating quite a lot. Um, in my previous roles with CSE, I was very much um, trying to think of, of language that is perhaps appropriate, but a bit more in a, a rehabilitative state. Um, children had already um, exhibited a lot of struggles, um, been put into care, um, and there was perhaps uh, not a lot of intention in um, moving them back to the areas they were from due to the severity of the circumstances. Uh, but at the, um, the Adolescent Resource Centre, ARC, is a wonderful provision that kind of steps in a few steps before that, um, tries to provide support before things escalate and before things um, kind of yield the difficulties that I've seen in other roles. Um, so yeah, they specialize in therapeutic support. I'm their representative music therapist. They have arts therapy, drama therapy, family therapy. I'm sure if you can name it, they'll, they'll have uh, something or they'll at least have looked into it. They do day uh, kind of excursions. I know lots of, um, whenever I've met people that work at ARC or tried to have meetings with them, they've turned up very sweaty because they've just had to go to kickboxing class with a, a young person before bringing them to a, a therapeutic support setting. Um, but these are the kind of interventions that are going on with this age group. Um, so yeah, I think I've covered a lot of that, but with um, uh, within these sessions, like I said, mus live music making, this kind of improvisational traditional music therapy approach um, has quite a lot of barriers. Um, so we have to kind of think out the box. This is where the, the songwriting thing comes over. As I mentioned, we're currently recording a, uh, <laughs> um, some drill and hip hop tracks um, with a young person who's um, very lyrical, very, um, very interested in, in what they communicate in reference to uh, who they idolize is communicating. Um, the active listening is a massive one, especially in early sessions. People, uh, especially young people, don't want to come in and speak to a, a, a talking therapist or a therapist that is working in a talking modality and just completely open up about their lives. That's my experience of this work anyway. Um, and instead, um, kind of putting on a playlist and kind of facilitating this and wondering, um, what this music does for us, um, when it becomes important and kind of how it allows us to regulate our emotions, um, certainly dominates earlier sessions. Um, and once this has happened, once the therapeutic relationship is, is built, I find that um, young people are more open and receptive to actually using discussion within a lot of the work. Um, but yeah, that, that improvisational music thing can have quite a few barriers, especially because people at the age of, as you can see, it's up to the age of about 17, their only experience of music largely is within um, a school environment. So there's a notion that people are good at music or people can't do music or that music is marked and graded or not just music, to be honest, any experience is A, B, C or D. Um, and lots of the children I work with um, perhaps struggle in an educational setting. So moving them away from this vulnerability in the early stages is really quite um, important in my work. Uh, yeah, moves us nicely on to educational provisions. I work in PRUs. Um, they're largely the ARC referrals, to be honest with you. Um, 
with a couple of other care homes involved as well. Uh, a lot, the majority of my educational work is in Cardinal College at the moment. Um, I move around a little bit, obviously being self-employed, depending on funding. But I uh, currently at Cardinal College, I'm running individual sessions, which you will see a bit of in a moment. Uh, and I'm also there's a group project coming up over the summer. Um, in fact, it feels like when summer comes up, everything becomes group session focused uh, due to you know the, the, the notion of summer holidays, especially working with young people. Uh, with Cardinal College, I am uh, employed or at least in collaboration with their additional learning needs space, which covers a, a wide variety of, of um, uh, needs and difficulties. Uh, and an awful lot of it is relational work. Following the pandemic, we've all, all experienced quite a lot of, of isolation over the last few years, and um, perhaps socialising uh, is has become um, a difficulty, and there's been delays in, in clients that um, otherwise perhaps weren't as developed um, as expected in these areas. Uh, I'm currently working at Springwood Primary School, which is a, a school in a, um, I'm sure it's okay to say that it's a slightly lower socioeconomic setting than um, other areas of Cardiff. An awful lot of the children, are, uh, uh, I want, I've got looked after children written down here. I'm aware they've changed the acronym to CLA. Um, so it's child looked after. Um, but that there's an awful lot of that population within this school. Um, and the concern and the referrals came about as, a, as a, um, an issue with attendance. There was an awful lot of, um, you know, 60% full classrooms day to day. Um, and by offering support to explore the difficulties that these children are having on returning to school or um, going through whatever um, proceedings they're going through in a more institutional sense away from the school uh, has provided, you know, there's, there's been some wonderful feedback and it's very, very obvious to see the benefits when you look at attendance records with some of the young people that are getting therapeutic support. Um, that being said, also music services. I'm aware Gwent Music. I've done quite a bit for upbeat music and arts. Um, they're starting to look into uh, the role of, of therapeutic support within education. They're aware that um, kind of perhaps uh, music therapists training sets us up quite well to work uh, in a musical, in an education setting with music, but with children that perhaps display um, difficulties of a, of a wide, in, a, in quite a wide sense. Um, but yeah, that's becoming more and more, more common in the work. Uh, and then there's residential settings. I think I've covered an awful lot of this, but I work with kind of, you know, in, in kind of multiple learning disability homes. Um, some come to me, some go to there. And I guess the key bit from this is that uh, at times in my career, I've also done quite a lot of, of staff support. Music therapy works wonderful, uh, wonderfully, sorry, with um, perhaps, again, a non-vulnerable, uh, non not as direct way of providing support to staff with the difficulties that come with their roles within uh, care homes. There's a lot of pro uh, projects going on, a lot of funding going into this area, a lot of research. Um, for me, I was providing clinical supervision for those in the, in the adolescent trauma homes who were obviously dealing with and, and hearing about some really quite difficult things that were bringing up stuff for them. So having a therapist uh, who was employed by the care home that could provide kind of um, on hand support at times was uh, certainly well received in my experience. Uh, coming up, some projects we've got coming up, which is really quite exciting. As I said, it's kind of becoming um, group work focused that tends to happen in the summer. Um, I guess no one wants to, to go out and social part of a group in in January and February that is not perhaps as, as promoted but these are some of the ones we've got coming up the two um, that look like they match the music and the uh, music therapy and the music introduction to jamming a part of this project this this area of funding here with first campus um, the music therapy one is actually starting is the one that's starting at 11 o'clock really excited to get going with that and the introduction to jamming is a one-off workshop that is beginning I say beginning, it's a one-off workshop, so it's happening. Uh, on uh, Monday, um, music therapy thing will be a focus group for six weeks with perhaps people who um, feel disenfranchised or struggle within the community. Um, and the introduction to jamming is to kind of promote perhaps a little more active promotion of music as a regulatory tool and the, and the, the power that kind of um, this kind of stuff can have. And then this is my song. This is one I'm really excited for. This is... Um, this post is the Cardiff and Vale College one, but ARC um, are also looking into funding for it. Um, so the Cardiff and Vale College one is aimed at their ALM base. A lot of their levers have been delayed in moving from uh, the college onto to further provision. And they want to kind of offer them something, um, offer them a chance to reflect, offer them a chance to, to, to leave 
um, the college with something. So I'm going in for, for six weeks to run uh, a songwriting course where we can kind of all reflect on, on our time within the college. Um, next steps, anxieties to do with that. So these are some projects I'm really quite excited to get off the ground in, uh, in the coming weeks or hours. Um, so yeah, let's get on to the, the perhaps more, more interesting bit that perhaps people have come to see. Uh, a case study. Um, I have permission to share this individual's name. Um, I, you would see it in the video anyway because of um, uh, the use of a hello song. And also, um, yeah, this, this individual um, is a cochlear implant recipient with additional learning needs and a, um, also cerebral palsy. So the, um, we use a bit of sign in the sessions, uh, which was actually an, an optional extra when I was studying at USW. I'm really quite grateful for that. I know uh, Beth Pickard was the instructor. I just did kind of an introductory course there, which has been an absolute lifeline in this work. Um, but yes, so um, Charlie re um, referred himself for this uh, this piece of work, which I thought was so powerful. And I got the, I guess, the kind of expected text. I'm sure a lot of you perhaps have this on your mind. Um, I had a text saying, well, is am I being silly, but is, is Charlie able to access music therapy? Um, yes. Uh, of course he is. I, um, you know, I, I had to, there's been some serious considerations as, as opposed to his, his auditory processing and what music and what sound means to him, what he's able to process as a result of um, having a cochlear implant. Um, luckily, I, actually, I did my master's thesis at USW on um, cochlear implant recipients and music therapy. So I was um, more prepared than, um, than I wasn't going in blind to this, this piece of work. But this individual referred himself for music therapy. Um, he, an awful lot of cochlear implant stuff, a lot of work that um, is going on across around the globe, but I imagine is experienced by Charlie, is a very medical model of disability. Those that have used music therapy have used it to kind of improve um, function, improve uh, understanding of music, um, but mainly in a speech sense, so that it becomes very practical and, you know, and how can we get you to to fit more in the society and to, to, you know, to fit in our confining little box. Um, but I wanted to really offer a chance for Charlie to, um, to explore the psychological impact of what he's going through as, as much as I would with, with any other individual. Um, it might be worth noting before we go into some of the videos, um, I'm aware time is running away, uh, but before we go into some of the videos, um, the cochlear implant limits some stuff. So those of you that are musical, um, minimal intervals, uh, it's quite small intervals um, don't get picked up. So uh, a C and a B may both, we think, um, may both be processed as a C. Um, this can be learned, you know, the, the more experience you have with it, the kind of better brain function can get at, at processing the difference. But a C, a B, a C sharp may all come in as a C, uh, whereas a C and a, the next note that may be available may be a, a, a G, for example. Um, so moving away from these smaller intervals was in my mind as much as I could keep it there. Um, rhythm and lyrics are normally quite accessible for cochlear implant recipients, but with the added difficulty of the um, ALN and cerebral palsy, considerations kind of had to be given towards um, how accessible this would be, um, kind of the physicality of, of that. Um, and timbre, so the, for, for those of you non-musical, almost like the colour of the sound, what the, what the sound actually sounds like. Um, I challenge anyone to to kind of to describe timbre, it's always one of those ones that, that stumps musicians and we all kind of fluster around it. Um, but that is kind of a, a no-go in terms of, of where Charlie is in his development. Um, a C on a piano and a C on a guitar would be um, uh, processed in exactly the same way. So moving away from that is um, probably of, of benefit. So um, in this first clip, uh, Charlie has asked me to, to share a drum with him. This is our fourth session. Um, we only were able to have five because of the, the timing of when they got me in. I'm hoping to start up again in September when the college goes back. Um, but in this session, uh, normally in sessions, he kind of just almost abuses instruments. There's uh, a need to, to kind of, um, it feels like he's pushing our relationship, the boundaries between us. He's seeing if I stay with him, um, if I'm able to... Um, if he's able to explore what he needs to explore while also maintaining a relationship feels quite key in some of the um, some of the experiences. And um, so, yeah, this one uh, starts with a hello song, which just frames the session. There's a bit of sign along there. Um, 
then he asks me to share um, the sharing drum and then there's a little bit of an improv on a cymbal. There are a few other clips to show some progression, but that's, I'll just get on with it. And sharing drum, yeah. together. Yeah. Ready? I'm going to uh, skip through some of these clips because I'm aware we're, we're a bit tighter on time than I was expecting. Um, perhaps I've gone on a little bit too much. But uh, as you can see, this um, has some, some physical um, benefits to this kind of this instrument. This is the first time he's asked me to play this with him. Um, but there's quite a lot of resonance from this kind of drum. Um, and as you see, we're sharing it between our legs. So there's um, uh, away from the, the auditory needs, he's able to uh, kind of feel what we're playing, which holds some benefit. Um, the rest of this clip, he kind of just goes on to play and explore a symbol, which I think where he's um, exploring his own notion of processing. I wonder if he's ever, one, been able to form a relationship away from his interpreter. Certainly every time I've seen him, he's, his interpreter's there. I know he has an interpreter at home as well. Um, I wonder if, you know, kind of how much of his own, um, the own stimulation, the, kind of the, the sounds that he wants to explore, he's been able to explore because they're quite dominant and uh, at times almost obnoxious. Um, and I wonder um, kind of how that's often perceived by others and um, what the value of having someone who is there for that purpose um, brings to the relationship. So I'll move on to the next one where um, this, you may want to turn your speaker's volume down just a little, uh, not say just a little bit, a fair bit. Um, we had, there's a couple of times where we both look away and it's because we've got people coming to check that we're okay because of the volume that is coming out of the music studios. Um, so it feels like he really gets to explore his aggression here. And um, it feels like my presence or my musical offerings are, are a bit irrelevant. It's more my presence that is offering something for him, the, the ability that we're, we're doing this together or I'm supporting him in what he wants to do. Um, I wonder if he's ever been able to kind of explore this extremity of his emotions away from this session. Um, there's an awful lot. Of, you, the stick is decomposing as he's playing it. Um, and at one point, he actually turns it around and does a stabbing motion. So, so keep your eyes out for this.
that to me felt quite needed um uh it feels like quite a unique opportunity for, for charlie to explore um kind of what his uh kind of the technological functions can pick up what he's able to withstand and what i'm able to withstand um additionally we i've spoken about music being a universal language but i guess um these kind of restraints that that charlie experiences as a result of his, his cochlear implant um uh, what i'm interested in this clip is it feels as if um, kind of music therapy goes into to offer a way to communicate between the two of us and what Charlie perhaps has done has created such a wall of noise um, that it's almost leveled the playing field a little bit that experience for me um, was really quite overwhelming I actually went and bought ear defenders straight after this session um, with anticipation of the next session um, and I wonder kind of um, what this offering of Charlie whether this is kind of um, a way into his world of being able to hear kind of this this, this barrage of, of noise and not being able to um, perhaps decipher it in the way that others can. Um, I've got one or two like kind of little one or two minute clips of some some perhaps some nicer moments um, in terms of our relational stuff because uh, it's worth mentioning that the first up until this like so what three quarters of the way through our fourth session um, this uh, what you've seen so far was the layup of the session it was very loud very obnoxious very look at all this noise I can make, look, look how much I can test my, my body as well with the, the kind of the physical capabilities. Um, really quite, let, let's push every boundary that we have. Um, and interestingly, that last improvisation that you just saw seemed to alleviate this need moving forward. Um, Charlie here points at a Queen poster that is on the wall um, and asks me to play it. Um, and because I'm aware of the notes that can be picked up, anything below a, a B for the um, well, that's what we consider. Anything below a, a B, uh, a low B on a um, bass guitar is perhaps um, unable to be picked up at all. It just doesn't exist because cochlear implants are designed for speech and the majority of us don't speak anywhere near that frequency. So Charlie points to the Queen poster and asks me to play it. Um, I've transposed it up so that hopefully it fits within his, um, his, his uh, auditory range. Um, as a result of this, um, it's really, it seems to me really well received. And I wonder if this is like kind of the first opportunity he's had to, to engage in kind of active listening to, to some, some music that we all take for granted. <laughs> A little bit of rocking out there um it's worth mentioning that when i first picked it up i did test i used the the original key which is an awful lot lower than that for the baseline um and there was very very limited response perhaps uh, more of a based on feeling as opposed to being able to auditory process what was going on um and then how long have we got left yeah we've got a couple of time for a couple um of minutes of some nice this felt only um uh, attainable after this kind of aggression had been explored, after this relationship had been pushed to the boundaries that it was. It was interesting that following this kind of extremity of exploration, um, we're actually able to have much more communicative musical interaction, um, as well as verbal interaction, as you can see there. Um, and every other session where he's chosen a djembe, he's, he's almost fought with his own body to make sure he can support it. And they're very heavy instruments, especially these ones. Um, and kind of there's been an it, it, it almost looks as if he's trying to prove to other people that he can 
he can support this gender and he can join in, which has been a theme for our work. Um, but interestingly, straight after he feels comfortable enough to go, okay, I've done that, I've proven myself. Um, can I have the, the one that is perhaps um, more accessible to me with my difficulties? Uh, the last little little 30 second clip I'll show is just from our very, very last interaction. Um, the piano, it felt like it hadn't existed throughout our time together because um, of how, I guess, not rhythmic, not textural it is. Um, but he actually asked us to play this together and there's a little lovely moment where he vocalizes um, and really demonstrates the, the, the value of our relationship to, to both of us, I think. <laughs> So that's, that's some drum on work. There's been some wonderful feedback on this from um, parents and his interpreter was quite keen on, on um, kind of stressing how, how much more social he seemed for the, the brief periods after sessions um, in kind of being social away from uh, the dominance of perhaps um, having the interpreter there all the time. Um, Humour became a real big part of the work um, and really allowed him to kind of explore his identity within this kind of, of, of notion of engagement. Um, there was some really fun, some funny things that were going on, as you can see at the end, there was kind of a, um, a little bit of a, a back and forth with slamming our hands on the piano, which seemed really well appreciated. Um, and I felt like this work really offered a way into an experience that, that Charlie was determined to get for himself and perhaps um, by other means would have been overlooked. Um, if you guys got any questions, let me know. Um, if you guys want any um, kind of references to some of the work I've done, obviously I've done the, the, a lot of research into cochlear implants. So if you want any references there, um, pop me an email. Uh, I'll pop my email in the chat now, and I'll also pop the link to that um, that video. Uh, sorry, the video, the page with the videos on of previous work. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Joshua. That was really, really great. It's great to see the breadth of the work and kind of the progress throughout. Um, there's a, a question from Angela Smith, um, who uh, asks. Um, well, uh, Angela, commends you on your sensitivity to your clients, Joshua, and wonders how long was the work funded for? Uh, so the work uh, was kind of set up as a little bit. Of, uh, so the, sorry, was this the, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it as if it's the Cardiff and Vale College, which I'm assuming it is. Um, the Cardiff and Vale College funding um, was set up for uh, an initial five week trial, which is what we've I've just shown clips of then. Um, that was, I guess, kind of confined because of the school term in college. Obviously, they end, they have exams in June, and then that's that's it. So it was Easter to the June half term. Um, I have been commissioned from September onwards. Um, not sure if it's going to be like you know September forever or kind of a September to October and then October till December sort of setup. Um, but it's through this base as well um, that I will be working in the songwriting program over the summer to to offer leavers something. Um, kind of an experience to, to reflect um, and really understand what they've been through over the last uh, couple of years with COVID and, and finishing college later than some of their peers. Great. And um, I think, Joshua, I think you put this through um, on direct message, I think, so we can all copy and paste the, your email. Ah, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> all right. um, so Isabella asks about um, if you've ever worked in the realms of technology-based music with clients. Um, it's something I'm very much interested in. Um, perhaps uh, I felt like I was slightly um, more interested in it than, than perhaps peers on my course uh, uh, coming from a, a more percussive background. And certainly my musical stuff involves uh, technology a little bit more than um, some of the, the my peers that I work with. Um, I'd love to look more into it. I'm aware that there's scope for an awful lot of um, 
kind of kind of work within this realm and certainly in terms of accessibility as you can see like kind of considerations are always made in terms of accessibility um specifically in my work um the i'm not going to show it to you because it's absolutely state in here but the, the electric drum kit you could see um prior in, in the in the photo um has it's a child's drum kit that's been built so that it's a, a as much of a, a normal height as we can so it's almost like a tabletop drum setup it's tr got triggered pads on so i've used um fiber skin um kind of the, the quiet stroke roland heads um so you can't actually hear the sound of the drums because it's kids drum kit sounds terrible um and then it's got tr uh, roland triggers on that runs into a um a drum brain so um, i do have clients that are wheelchair bound have very limited movement um some want to just use uh, chimes and the frame drum together but i do have one or two younger clients that by kind of positioning with the right kind of positioning this uh, electronic drum kit can move over it's all on my social media if you guys want to check out nodding glass but this can be moved um so that it's kind of a usable and appropriate uh, setup where very limited movements if i get the, the sensitivity right on the machine very limited movements can uh, trigger all sorts of drum sounds if i plug it into my laptop um gets all sorts of other sounds i can get you know see on a piano through it um it's currently got a setup of uh, two drum pads, two cymbal pads, two foot pads. So it kind of depends on the client. So I've had a little bit of a look into this kind of stuff. I'd love to look more into it. If you're music tech based, then be my guest. You're an awful lot, um, perhaps more set up for this than I am. Um, but there is scope for this within within this work. Great. And then there's a couple of questions about how you structure the, the sessions and then also uh, <laughs> setting boundaries when it comes to damaging instruments in um in music therapy uh that yeah that's a that's a learning curve <laughs> <laughs> um so i structure settings I, I usually when i deem it appropriate i start with a hello and a goodbye song um, i'm well aware that if i tried that with some of the teenagers i work with um i would be told where to go in some rather colorful language i imagine because um it's perhaps quite an accessible medium that is uh deemed not appropriate by teenage clients um so hello and goodbye song to frame the session and then it's kind of a case of um working off what the client brings um so i'm psychodynamically trained so i very much like to work with with what's in the room what the feeling in the room is um what i the client needs that day what the client is communicating um it becomes quite apparent i i with with um perhaps more verbal clients that are hesitant to get involved in improvisation stuff I may make some offers, you know, do you want to put, should we make a playlist together? Do you want to show me some of your songs? Um, do you play music? Is there anything you kind of want to sit and do with me? Or, or is there something that you really, really need to talk about today? Um, so it's it's very improvised as a whole, I guess. Um, and boundaries in terms of breaking instruments. Um, uh, don't use instruments you like is my biggest bit of advice. Um, I've got my, you know, everything in here. If it is in this room, I've got to accept it may be broken. Um, there was a ukulele that's meant to be traveling with me today um, that's had the strings ripped off yesterday. Um, I've had some skins poked through. Um, I try and, and stress to clients that um, part of our agreement is that I'd appreciate it if you could respect the instruments when we get in the room, but that's always, you know, with, as you've seen with Charlie, that may not be appropriate or, um, you know, an, an option. So I've got to grin and bear it. Um, you know, if, if, a, if a symbol breaks once a year, I go back on Facebook Marketplace and I buy, a, I buy another symbol. Wow, well, yeah, yeah, I can, I can imagine, <laughs> I can imagine the whole uh, setup in terms of the instruments. Um, uh, there was one last question, but I, I'm very aware that you have to lead a session very soon, and you have to get all those instruments in that car. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, uh, it's gonna be good fun. Um, I, can, yeah. I can, I can see the questions come through. I can quickly give a break, brief while I'm packing everything down. Um, so, uh, is it the bottom question? I'm interested in how much talking plays a part. Yes. So um, we, it depends on the client group um, with ASD, PMLD, non-verbal clients. Talking doesn't necessarily play any part. Um, that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to, to offer you an alternative to talking. Um, it's mainly the adolescent clients where um, music can feel quite vulnerable, even though they've, they've shown intent to engage in the service. Um, coming in and just, hey, should we play some music is, is terrifying. I certainly would have been terrified at that time. Um, so... Sometimes conversation is needed. Sometimes, um, sometimes I try and, and um, explore whether a, whether a teenager is is aware of why why they're sat in front of me today. Um, 
kind of what institutional stuff has led to them being here, um, what decisions they've made themselves that have made them want to get this support. This kind of feels an awful lot of scope for, um, for appropriate conversation, uh, uh, kind of as an adjunct to music as opposed to as a talking therapy. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense to me. Brilliant. Cool. Um, <laughs> I've got to shoot off. Um, my email is listed in the chat. If any, you do have any questions about the course, anything you want to do, like I said, I'm saying that I'm not currently working as a lecturer, but I have. <laughs> I do I work in junk with the university. Um, any questions, let me know. Any references, any kind of interests, pop it in there. Um, check out the social media. You might find that some of the technology questions is slightly answered there, but if not, get in touch. Um, enjoy the rest of the day. I'm sure there's some wonderful stuff. I'm really going to be missing out on it. I've got to go and run a session. I'll... Exactly.